Hello everyone. Welcome to the Growing Season webinars. This is the third and final webinar and we've got with us Nathan Brockman and Susan Applegate Hurst. They're going to be presenting today about growing herbs and attracting pollinators. So just a little bit about the webinar today. We're going to have the pollinator presentation first. We're going to take a little bathroom break and then we're going to talk about growing herbs. Just a few things for you to know. Unfortunately, this webinar is not live, so you cannot ask a question uh, today, but you can email your presenters and pass along your questions to them. Also, we are going to have two small discussion breaks, so please take those five-minute breaks to talk amongst yourselves about the questions that the speakers have posed. You've got a few handouts that you can use to take notes during this presentation. And also, please don't forget to fill out the evaluation for this webinar. We love hearing your feedback. And also, don't forget to record your hours. Please jump over to the hours reporting system and enter your hours. And if you haven't already heard, we are switching to a new hours reporting system. So more details about that are going to be coming soon. It's going to be a lot more user friendly, so hopefully it's a lot easier to record those hours. And also, for anyone who is not yet a Master Gardener, please join us. Start your Master Gardener journey this September. We are hosting the training in 42 locations, and we would love to have you take that training to become a Master Gardener. We're really proud of our volunteers and would love to have you join. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Nathan. Hello, my name is Nathan Brockman and I'm the Butterfly Wing Curator at Ryman Gardens. Today we're going to talk about gardening for pollinators. It was funny, when I first got started at the gardens, I used to give lots of butterfly gardening talks. Uh, then colony collapse disorder and people wanted a lot more pollinator talks. Good thing, basic same information works for both. So today we're going to talk about, you know, gardening for pollinators. But first thing we need to talk about is why garden for pollinators. First and foremost, insects are fun to watch. Uh, if you haven't spent time in your garden yet watching insects running around, you should. So go outside and sit and watch them flying from flower to flower, climbing from plant to plant. Animals are a big pollinator, or animals, insects are a good pollinator for our plants. So whether it's our food crops or it's just our flowers in our garden so that we get more seeds from our flowers, we need insects doing our pollination. And there's a lot of numbers people like to throw out and things like one third of our food that humans consume comes from pollination done by insects. Uh, so, you know, they are important for that as well. Uh, one of the problems that, that's happening with them is fragmentation, so habitat fragmentation. So us planting more pollinator-friendly, insect-friendly plants out there helps with that fragmentation problem. Um, and then it increases species diversity if you are pollinator gardening, so you get more insects in your yard. Uh, one of the problems that many of us gardeners have is we get pest insects in, and we get all upset that, you know, the mealybugs or aphids are attacking our garden plants. Well, if you've got more of the beneficials, more of the predators out in your gardens, then they'll take care of those pest species for you. So diversity is good. So, but why are we losing our pollinators in the wild? Uh, one of the big ones is loss of native habitat. Uh, you know, Iowa is a great one to look at. Iowa used to be covered with native tall grass prairies. Uh, we don't have as much of the tall grass prairies we used to, but we still have some. Uh, but there's no reason that some of the other areas can't be reintroduced to help with pollinators, like roadside ditches or uh, some of the CRP along farmlands, adding more pollinator friendly to help them out. Disease has become an issue. Uh, it's one of the issues for colony collapse disorder, but as things get moved around, diseases get moved around. Um, and we're introducing new stuff as we bring in new organisms from other countries, um, new diseases. But that also ties into the non-native species coming in as well. Uh, we had a wonderful display of native lady beetles that used to be found across the state but we've now introduced other lady beetle species that are out-competing our native lady beetles, um, and then their numbers have unfortunately gone down because of a non-native beneficial brought in to help us out, um, but the native stuff just can't compete as well as the introduced individuals. 
Change in lawn care and garden practices are two other things that have kind of changed and declined. I get told all the time at the gardens uh, by people that are visiting, you know, I just see less insects than I used to. And then I ask the question, what did your yard used to look like? You know, was it this perfect manicured lawn with these pristine flowers? Or was it a little bit on the weedy side and the grass got a little taller and there was always kind of this stock of area that wasn't well maintained? Um, and a lot of times people come back and say, well, yeah, you know, I mow pretty well and to keep the plants nice. So that kind of plays into some of the decline. Pesticide usage, um, especially if you're you're not watching what you're using, how much any pesticide you apply will affect insects. Um, uh, definitely insecticides will, but you know your fungicides and those other ones have effects as well. So limiting as much as possible, there is a place for it, but limiting as much as possible can help pollinators survive. And then roadside management. At one time, roadside ditches were just essentially native habitats. Uh, then mowing became very popular as a visualization. And now we've kind of come full circle again where areas are trying not to mow. They're trying to manage those as native habitats. Now, unfortunately, in the state, um, we have a lot of individuals that are in need of help. Uh, officially state listed, currently, there are uh, two endangered species of butterflies, five threatened, and 25 species of concern. Now that's an old list. It's 12, 15 years old uh, that was created back then. And those were officially listed. So someone took the time to go through the legislative process and get them put on the official Iowa list of endangered and threatened species. But that's just butterflies. There's other species, beetles and flies and, and other things, moths, that are in danger as well. This is actually the current working list uh, that the DNR is working with. And you can see they've modified it significantly, uh, where there's now high, which would be your endangered, medium would be your threatened, and your low is your species of concern. Uh, the Dakota skipper that's on the list there is actually one of our state-listed endangered species. And it was recently just added as a federally listed threatened species. And the Pau Chic Skipperling, which as you can see on high over there, is now a federally listed um, endangered species. So those are Iowa's two first species that we have in the state that are federally listed. Um, and unfortunately, both the Dakota and Pau Chic are believed to be extirpated out of the state now. Uh, so the only way that we're going to get them back now is doing more work and bringing them back in with the aid of some captive rearing program or something along those lines. If you're looking at the list here, the ones that are in um, dark blue, they're all kind of about the same, hopefully they're a little different for you on your side, the darkest blue ones are the state endangered species. The lighter blue are the species that are the state currently threatened species, and the light blue are the ones that are species of concern. Everything green is new things that have been added. A big portion of these individuals that are on this list are grass-feeding skippers, but they're a lot of prairie um, endemic species. They need our native prairie habitats if they're going to survive, or at least the plants we would have had in them for them to survive. So we're not going to spend much time on this as master gardeners or master gardeners in training. You've gotten a lot on flowers. You know your flower things. But for pollination to happen in a lot of plant species, the plants evolved with our native pollinators, and therefore the native pollinators are great at moving their pollen, helping the flowers pollinate themselves. So one of the big things I like to push for any group I talk to is learn your native pollinators. Uh, and a great resource to use is bugguide.net. If you're not familiar with bugguide, bugguide is an Iowa um, kind of housed website. Uh, it's actually housed here at Iowa State University um, by the Department of Entomology here on campus. And it's a website where you can go, you can post a photo of an insect you don't know, and the leading expert maybe out of Germany will hop on and say, oh, that's such and such species. And we've had a lot of great interactions on the website where People are, you know, professionals, amateurs, enthusiasts, hobbyists are all posting stuff, helping each other out, identify insects, sharing information. And we've had some really great stories where kids even, high school, middle school kids have posted an insect they found in their backyard. And then it turns out that the leading expert in another country was like, we didn't even know that was there. And this high school kid and this research professional are now working together or have worked together to publish papers on these insect species. So it's been a lot of fun. 
All right, so let's talk about our pollinators. Who's pollinating and who's doing what? So what you're going to see here is you see we've got honeybees up there right now. In a minute, I'm going to show you a list. And I don't care if you can actually read the list of the crops they feed. I just want you to see the number of plants that are on their list. So I'm going to show you the agricultural crops that are pollinated by honeybees, by bumblebees, by everybody. When you initially start talking about pollinators, most people, their brains immediately jump to bees, which is great. But then they jump right into honeybees, as in honeybees do all the pollination. They get all the credit. But there are a lot of other species that are doing pollination work. Honeybees is just one. Now, the reason that honeybees get a lot of credit, though, is they have a really big list of plants that they pollinate. So these are all agricultural crops that use honeybees as their pollination. Bumblebees. Where honeybees are a managed population, they had to be introduced into the United States even. When the Europeans came over, they brought honeybees with them. Um, I don't know that I would want to have been on that ship at that time when they were bringing over hives of honeybees, uh, but they did, and they introduced them. So before the European settlers came over, there were no honeybees in the United States. Bumblebees did a lot of that pollination work. Bumblebees are a great bee. They are like the kitty cats of the bee world. They do not want to sting you. They're big, they're furry, and if you know what you're doing, you can actually pet them. Um, and, and, and they're great to have around. Now, they do pollinate some agricultural crops, but not as many as the honeybees do. But you'll see the ones that are in red up there. Those are crop species that are only pollinated by bumblebees and not pollinated by honeybees. So things like tomatoes, and I like to use tomatoes because they're a big kind of cash crop, and probably all of you, if you're raising any vegetables, you're raising tomatoes. Um, tomatoes can be wind pollinated, but they do better when they're buzzed by bumblebees. Um, you can also go out in your garden and do it with a little electric toothbrush going from flower to flower, but that takes a lot of your time. If you have bumblebees doing it for you, they can actually raise your production of your tomatoes by them visiting those flowers. They do so well that a lot of the hydroponic or the glasshouse tomato production facilities will actually buy in bumblebee boxes and put them in their glass houses with them to pollinate their tomatoes. So bumblebees are great. Then we have things like our leafcutter bees, our mason bees, our, um, you know, our other smaller bees, um, some of our ground-dwelling nesting bee species. A lot of these individuals, they don't even sting. Um, oftentimes they're a very early season bee species, so a lot of our um, tree, early flowering tree species benefit from these. And when colony collapse disorder kicked in, there was a lot of work and a lot of talk of switching over to using these as a replacement for honeybees if it came to it. Um, they're another species that you can manage in uh, sort of a captive sort of breeding thing, and we'll talk more about that later in the presentation. But you can see some of the crops that they pollinate here. Butterflies and moths. They kind of get uh, neglected as being pollinators, but they do pollinate. They are pollinators, and there are some very specific plants that they only pollinate that other things won't. And without those specific butterflies or moth, that plant would not get pollinated. So what agricultural crops do they pollinate? Nothing! Nothing that is used in the sense um, to where they're identified as being one of the big agricultural pollinators. But again, they are good pollinators. They do pollinate, um, just not things like our tomatoes or our almonds, some of those big... Um, orchards where they bring in the, the butterflies to pollinate. Beetles are another one. They're not listed as being a big pollinator for our agricultural crops, but they do a lot of great pollination. Now they are a wasteful pollinator. Uh, if you watch your bumblebees in your yard, uh, they typically are covered in the pollen because they like to roll in it. Um, they're also considered to be a poor pollinator because they are eating the pollen off of the plants. Um, not great for the plant. They're losing some of their pollen that way. So beetles are good, um, and they will do some pollination. Now the group that really gets overlooked a lot, and most people are always like, uh, flies? Why would I want to promote flies in any ways? You know, they get in my house, they affect my picnics, whatever the case may be, flies are bad. Flies are actually really good, and really good for pollination. And one reason is their numbers are really high. 
They're not a wasteful pollinator. When they visit a plant, they only get so much pollen on their body. They're not feeding them the pollen. They're actually usually nectaring from the plant. Um, the reward that the plant is producing for them to come take their pollen anyways. So they're a good pollinator to have out there. And they're crisp and clean. Um, and another one, if you could figure out how to manage them better, would be a good one to use, and especially like a greenhouse situation, to do a lot of your pollination of your plants inside. Now, all the species that we just talked about go through complete metamorphosis, where they make this complete change, going through four basic stages, your egg, your larva, or your pup, or your, your larva, or your um, maggot, perhaps, depending on what species you're talking about, and then a pupil form, and then finally an adult stage. Um, the nice part about this life cycle is the young does not typically compete with the adults. They're feeding on different resources. Uh, where if you're talking about grasshoppers, an immature grasshopper nymph is going to feed on the same thing as the adult will. So let's get into the gardening part of things. Uh, a lot of your basic garden things apply to pollinator gardens as well. So you want some pretty good sun exposure. A lot of your pollinator type plants are not shade plants, they're sun plants. So you need a good six hours of sun if you want to have, you know, a good pollinator garden. Well-drained soil is always well, you know, is always nice, but if you do have a bog type of garden, it's okay, but you just have to change your plant selections for plants that handle more of a wet, constantly wet um, soil composition. Uh, size is a consideration. You can put together a good pollinator garden in a pot, uh, but you're only going to have so many resources. The bigger is often the better when you're talking about putting together a pollinator garden. Having enough resources as a whole for them to feed on throughout. Having some of the surrounding structures is really good. Um, you don't want your trees shading out or your bushes shading out your nectar plants, but having some of those solid structure things is great. Species like monarchs, they take this migratory hike before they pupate. They won't typically do it on the milkweed because if there's other monarchs on there, they're going to eat the leaves, eat the stalk, and that pupa is going to end up on the ground. So they'll go for really long walks sometimes. 20, 30 feet, 40 feet is not unheard of for them. Um, I've actually got one at home that crawled off my garden, crawled over to my house, and is hanging right above the eave on my door, which is great for my kids. Um, and then, you know, know your hardiness zone. Plant plants that grow well in those areas. Don't plant tropicals expecting them to do well um, throughout the winter. Uh, they're just going to die off and you'll be frustrated. Plant things that are hardy. That's where going native is great. Our native butterflies evolve with our native plants. They do well together. Um, but planting some tropicals uh, things can work well and add to your garden, uh, especially if you have smaller spaces. A lot of container things don't do as well with natives as they can do with the tropicals. And I already mentioned lots of sun. So let's talk about some general rules when selecting and laying out your plants. Again, I can't stress enough, plant natives whenever possible. Uh, they do well with our native species. But at the same time, I'm not going to say don't plant tropicals because there are a lot of tropical plants when I go through some plant selections here that you'll see that aren't native. Um, I don't discourage planting of tropicals. Um, they can do really well sometimes in certain situations. So some other important things. When you're planting for butterflies, you want to plant large clusters of the same species of plants. Your butterflies, when they go to feed from a plant, and I'm going to use lantana and pentas as my examples, which are what I have in the butterfly wing at Ryman Gardens, a lot of them. Um, when they're fe my butterflies feeding from pentas, they feed faster if they continue to feed from the penta flowers. If they run out of nectar or if they want to switch and go to, say, lantana, penta is a large clustered flower. Lantana is a small clustered flower. They have to relearn how to feed when they switch from that different type of plant, which means it takes them longer, takes more of their day, um, because they have to figure out how far to put the proboscis, how much weight they can apply, how long they should check each one to see if there's nectar in it. Um, so it's actually beneficial, and they feed more if they feed from the same type of plant over and over again. And you can watch butterflies in your gardens. Uh, they'll even do what's called trap lining. It's a feeding behavior where they'll visit the same flowers, the same types of flowers, day after day in the same space. So if you've got them in your garden, go back the next day, you should see them again. 
When you're talking a lot of the pollinator gardening, your bee gardening, you want to have several different colors because different pollinators are attracted to different colors. And we're going to talk about color selection and scent selection in a minute more on a species specific basis. So having lots of bright colors is really good. A variety of sizes, your larger butterflies will visit your larger flowers where your smaller butterflies like your skippers, they just can't get their proboscis deep enough in the flowers so they need smaller flowers for them to feed from. So big and small flowers is wonderful things. Um, a diversity of plantings for all seasons is great. Uh, and that falls in because we have pollinators out there. There are butterflies out there all year round. We even have butterflies here in Iowa that overwinter in the state as adult butterflies. Not everybody flies to Mexico and, and drinks those drinks with the little umbrellas um, like the monarchs do. Some of them tough it out here in the state. Um, something like a morning cloak would overwinter as an adult butterfly here in the state. Host plants are important. If you want adult butterflies flying around in your yard, you need host plants. And we're going to come back and talk more about host plants in a bit. But you need the caterpillars. You need the females laying eggs in your yard. We know that certain species of butterflies, the adults only live in a certain radius from where they spent their time as a caterpillar. So you want your yard to be where they spent their time as a caterpillar. And then different heights. For your flies and your beetles, you know, your beetles are crawling in your garden. They like the lower plants. A lot of your bees, they like higher plants. But then at the same time, if you're up high, birds have a better chance of getting you. So a lot of other insects like to be that mid-range. Um, so having different heights in your plants is a great thing for some of our other pollinators. So some considerations for butterfly gardening or for pollinator gardening. All right, so what do the different individuals like? So, and these are general guidelines based on that. Some of them will vary. But your bees typically like your bright colors, your whites, your blues. Um, honeybees do not see the color red at all. So planting red flowers for insect pollinators, a lot of them don't even see it. Um, so you can stop. Plant the other colors. You'll see there's some other species that do like red. But for your bees, your honeybees, they can't see the color red. They can still see the shape and know it's a flower, but don't see red. They like um, to have nectar guidelines or guides, which are typically um, a UV pattern. Uh, it might be runway strips pointing into the middle, and I have a slide later that will show this off, um, or a bullseye pattern in the middle of the flower. Um, so that's what the nectar guides are. They like fresh smelling plants, mild, pleasant. Um, odor will come in much more important with our last one we'll talk about. And then pollen. Uh, you know, they, they like there to be pollen, but really they're a lot of times coming for a lot of the nectar, but they are packing pollen and taking it back to their nest to, you know, help them make their honey. And then they want a shallow or tubular flower shape. Our moths, they don't care as much about the color. Um, some of our moths, they're flying, coming in late at night or later in the evening where color isn't as important to them. Um, for them, what they care a lot about is the scent. A strong scent, especially a night-admitted scent, is important for a lot of the moth species. Um, they typically want a tubular-shaped flower. And they really don't care all that much about ne or the pollen because they're coming for the nectar. Our butterflies, on the other hand, they are day flying, coming to the flowers. They want bright colors again. Um, you can have some red, but they still don't see red the same way as we see red. So a lot of them, red, while they'll see it, isn't as big of a, an important color for them in the flowers again. Um, they like for there to be guidelines, so this UV pattern in there to help show them right where to go for their nectar reward to make it quick. And they like fresh smelling plants. Uh, again, this, the scent thing will, will be about the same until we get to the very end. Um, they like there to be nectar. Do they like there to be lots of nectar because that's why they're coming. They don't really care about pollen again whatsoever, although some species will use pollen as a protein source, and they'll build it up on their proboscis, which is really kind of fun to see. Um, more of the tropical species, your long wings, your heliconius will do that. Uh, and then they want it to be tubular shaped because they're going for the nectar. So they need the tubular shaped flower so they can put their proboscis way down in. It helps them then also not compete with other species that are going to go to different shaped flowers like our beetles. Which are next up. Now they'll go for more of the dull whites and they like the green colors. Green is a color found in flowers. 
Um, oftentimes you think of green just in the foliage, but plants do have green flowers, which is fun. Um, they don't really care as much about the UV patterns, uh, but they want strong, fragrant odors that draw them into those types of plants. Um, they like there to be lots of pollen because they're coming to eat a lot of the pollen. The pollen will cover them. Uh, and they like these big open flowers that they can crawl up onto and actually, you know, they just roll and get it all over themselves. So lots of pollen, um, a big open flower that they can crawl on and basically eat. Um, again, you know, a lot of people get mad when they see beetles eating on their flowers, but they're also pollinating at the same time, unless they're Japanese beetles and they're eating all of it. Then finally we have the flies. They have a whole different set of, of requirements. Um, they don't care as much about the bright colors. Um, nectar is, is okay, uh, but really the fun part about flies, if you want flies in your garden, you need the putrid smelling flowers. Um, there's actually the flowers like the corpse flower, which actually smells as the name implies, like a dead corpse. And the flies come in and they do the pollinating, and that's who comes and does it. Some beetles will do it as well. Um, but, but yeah, this is the one group where fresh and fragrant and pleasant is thrown out the window and putrid wins out overall. Um, you know, there to be the pollen. And they'll go in, they'll crawl into funneled shape, they'll go to open flowers, um, they'll visit a lot of different types of flower shapes. So, and that's our flies. So if you want to get your flies, there's some ideas to get them. Flies are good. They're not bad. Now, I mentioned host plants and host plants being important. If you want butterflies in your gardens, you have to have host plants. I one time did a program, and a lady at the end of the program raised her hand and says, I've got these green, black, and yellow worms, and they keep eating all my dill and my parsley. So I just calmly asked her, you know, what do you do with those worms when you find them in your garden? She was like, I squish them and I throw them out. So my next question to her was, do you like the black swallowtail? And she looked at me with these bright eyes. Oh, I love seeing them flying around in my yard. They're great. And then I go, well, you've been squishing the caterpillars of black swallowtails all these years. And her face changed like four shades of white. This is where knowing your insects is a good thing. Um, if you want to have adult butterflies flying in your yard, you've got to have the caterpillar somewhere. So what I usually recommend is plant more of their host plants and let them have half. They don't typically eat it all. And if they do, you didn't plant enough for them. You suffer, you can always go buy some from somebody else at the farmer's market or wherever else. Borrow it from a friend who doesn't have them. So if you want black swallowtails, Parsley and dill are a great plant for them. If you want monarchs, we have to have milkweed. Milkweed is their host plant, and to have monarchs, we have to have milkweed. Um, there's some contention, you know, when they named it, whoever put weed in their name was did them no favors, because then everyone wants to rip out anything that has weed in its name. Um, but we have to have milkweed to have monarchs. Now, for you brave gardeners, remember, a weed is only a weed if you don't want it there. Corn growing in a bean field is considered a weed. So stinging nettle is actually a great plant for red admirals, painted ladies, question marks, commas. Yes, I know it is a weed in most people's eyes. And yes, when it's in your garden, you bump against it, it does sting. But at the same time, if you want those butterflies, you have to have the plants. I don't recommend putting it in the front of your garden. Um, just let it grow out in a corner somewhere, because typically it will grow there, and we go in after it and rip it out. But if you want these butterflies, it's got to be around or you won't have those butterflies anymore. And there's a list we'll talk about later where you can find more host plants that you can have in your garden to have more butterflies feeding. So let's talk about some of the plants now. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on each plant. I'm just going to kind of talk about some and why they work well. Um, zinnias are a great one. You can grow them for seed. They're fairly cheap. A lot of butterflies, large and small, will go to them. There's a lot of plant breeding with this. So you've got different heights, you've got different sizes, and they're usually really good at producing lots of nectar. They do really well in gardens um, and in containers. Lantana, a tropical individual, um, also comes in lots of different colors. Typically your, your yellows, oranges, purples, pink sort of range. Um, but has lots of flowering heads, lots of nectar. Again, a tropical, we use it at the butterfly um, 
at the, at, at the butterfly house, the butterfly wing at Ryman Gardens all the time because it produces so much nectar. Um, for individuals that are doing native zoo, not one you're going to want to have. And in Iowa, you have to treat this tropical plant as a perennial, even though in southern states or in other countries, it can grow as an annual because they have a warmer climate. Your sage or your salvias. I'm a salvia guy. I always call them salvias. Um, they do well. Not only will some of the butterflies visit them, but they're really good for some of our bees as well. Um, some of the other pollinators do better on salvias than um, some of the than the butterflies will. But again, lots of different colors, different heights, different shapes, lots of things you can choose from, a different habitats they'll grow differently in. So if you've got a dryer yard, you can choose some to do better there than in wet yards. So a lot of options in the salvia range. Pentas, another tropical that does really well in containers. Um, we use this again in the butterfly wing all the time. Uh, different colors, here you can get um, whites and purples, uh, pinks, um, not so much in the orange range, um, but large flowering clustered heads uh, do very well. Lots of nectar. Milkweed. Milkweed's like that bonus plant. It's a host plant and a nectar plant. The only downside is if you're really doing well with your caterpillars, they'll eat all your leaves and your nectar flower production goes way, way down. But at least then you've got monarchs and they can go visit other flowers. Um, but when you don't have caterpillars eating on them, the flowers are highly sought after by many species of butterflies and other pollinators. Um, right now at the gardens, we've got a bunch of wasps that are really enjoying a lot of the swamp milkweeds and uh, the, the butterfly milkweed, the tuberosa that we've got out there. We've got three in this picture here. We've got a picture of a swamp milkweed, um, the tuberosa, which often gets called the butterfly weed, um, and then we have the common milkweed on the far side, the, the one that's by itself. Um, you know, really, common milkweed is kind of our bread and butter. We need more of that one. Unfortunately, it doesn't grow as organized and as managed as some of the other species do. It's one of those milkweeds, if you've got it in one part of your year one year, the next year it might grow way over there and not here again. Um, but it, it is really a great one. And in, when they have the choice, that's where a lot of our native ones will lay their eggs on that common milkweed. Coneflowers! are great. Um, they're a good one. You can get native. There's also many that have been modified through plant breeding, so you can get different colors, heights, different flowering times. Um, you just have to be careful that they haven't been bred out, and we're going to talk more about it later, but bred out to where they don't produce any pollen or nectar. Um, so coneflowers are a great one. Some others just quick through. Sunflowers can work really well. Um, for certain species. Butterfly bush. I often get in trouble for this one. In some parts of the United States, this has been listed a noxious weed. In Iowa, it has not been listed a noxious weed yet. If you live down in Lee County and some of the southern parts of states, it might seed a little bit, but doesn't really seed and spread like it has been in California or Florida, Texas, some of those areas. But it's really a great plant, especially late in the season, um, and really easy to find. A lot of the garden centers still sell this stuff in mass. So I really like it, um, and until... Climate change changes enough to where it establishes itself in, um, I still push it as a good plant. Um, if you're going all native, though, it's not for you. Rutabecchia, um, and, and then the, the liatris um, are two other good ones. Now, I also wanted to throw in, because I'm a big uh, tomato gardener. I do hydroponic tomatoes in my garden outside, and I love bumblebees because they pollinate my tomatoes, as I mentioned before. So I've actually, my three plants that I've been pushing for people to plant right now um, are the alliums, which are just covered with pollinators right now. They're in full bloom. Um, the hyssops, a good native plant that you can plant that the bumblebees especially love that plant. And the calamint. Um, not only will you get a lot of bumblebees to it, but a lot of the flies just really enjoy that. And some of the wasps, some of the large wasp species as well. And again, as long as you're not bothering them in your garden, they won't bother you. Uh, and having them around, a lot of the wasp species are great because they're predators. They're going to eat a lot of those pest species that are feeding on your garden. So here's three if you want to up your bumblebees. These are three plants you really should have for your, your bumblebees in your yard. Now, I mentioned some plants aren't good for butterflies anymore. So here's two pictures of impatiens. The, hopefully for you, it's the on the right, is your standard impatient, the far one over there. 
Um, and the other one is a rose-headed impatient. The rose head is created through plant breeding. They've modified the pistil stamen part of the plant to make it look more full, but they modified the reproductive parts of the plant, meaning it doesn't produce any nectar or pollen for the butterflies anymore. So be careful when you're selecting your plants. I also had a little piece that I talked about the guides. The guides are UV patterns. So some of our plants have UV patterns in them. Um, maybe in the case of this plant here, the pollen is fluorescing the UV light. So one thing I like to recommend for gardeners is to grab your favorite beverage, go out into your garden at night with a black light, and shine it on your flowers and see what kind of guides you have, UV patterns you have in your flowers you can't see during the day. Um, your neighbor's going to think you're crazy walking around in your yard with a black light flashlight, but you're having a good time, so what's it matter? A fun flower that does really well under UV light that most of you probably are getting rid of out of your yard, but when you shine it with UV, it'll make it much more fun to have, is dandelions. And dandelions are also a good season um, source of food for some of our early season pollinators as well. So don't get rid of all those dandelions. Now, we supplement our food at the Butterfly Wing at Ryman Gardens because we have so many butterflies. And you can do this at home as well. You just have to be careful because you're going to get way more bees, wasps, ants, flies, beetles than you will ever get butterflies to these other things. We do things like artificial nectar dishes where we'll have... Um, We'll do a honey solution, like a 5% honey with water. Or we'll do a diluted, sh just sh plain sugar with 5% sugar with water. Um, we'll even dilute lemon-lime Gatorade. You could use any flavor. It doesn't matter. We just were donated a whole bunch of lemon-lime Gatorade one time. Um, other people have different flavors they like. But basically, you want to dilute it. You want about four a quarter strength of the listed instructions and put it out. Make sure you have some sort of scrubber sponge or something so they don't just fall in the water and drown. Sap on trees is another good food source for some of our species that don't visit flowers. Um, morning cloaks don't visit flowers. They don't drink nectar. In the wild they visit things like dung, urine, carrion, rotting fruit, and tree sap. And so tree sap's a good one. And that's why also rotting fruit. So don't pick up all the fruit when it falls in your garden. Leave some of it out there for the pollinators to come and feed on. Um, butterflies, bees, wasps, they'll all come. Ants, they'll all be there. But they need to eat too. Some other supplemental foods, uh, things like honeydew. So this is actually honeydew for magnolia scale on magnolia. And they'll come in and they'll eat this sugary solution excreted by... Um, different insect pest species. So whether they're uh, a mealworm or a scale or a, uh, an aphid. So now it's time for your discussion period. Um, so talk amongst yourselves and I'll be right back to continue my presentation.
All right, so let's get back at it. Um, so gardening practices that will help you with your pollinators. Leave your cleanup till spring. If you clean up in the fall, you're just going to haul everything away with you. All your overwintering pupa, your overwintering caterpillars, a lot of the adults of different pollinators who be in your garden, you're just going to haul them away to a compost pile or to the refuge, wherever it might be, and, and they won't do well there. So leave it till spring. Um, don't remove all broken branches because some of the stuff will nest in that. Um, leave some uncovered soil for the ground nesting individuals, your ground nesting bees. If it's all just really tight turf or planted flower beds with really packed tight, your ground nesting um, bees won't be able to, to live anywhere in your yard and they'll have to go elsewhere. Uh, avoid the total manicured yard. If it's totally manicured, grass does nothing for most insects except for things like Japanese beetles they like if you keep doing that. So keep it up and they'll they'll keep coming to your yard and laying their eggs. So let it be a little weedier, grow it a little higher. Um, if you mow really low all the time, things like the grass feeding skippers won't be able to live there. You'll chop up all their caterpillars. Uh, and then watch your tilling so you don't till up any nesting um, bee species. Create corridors. You know, we talk a lot about corridors with roadside ditch plantings, but even in your yard, we're talking insects, tiny little individuals. For them to go from one side to the other it takes a long time. So having interlocked planting so they can get from one large planting space to another helps them move throughout even your own yard. Have different canopy layers so that um, if they need to get out of the sun, they can get into the shade. Or if there's a really big storm coming through with lots of wind, those canopies can help a lot. And then incorporate a water source. If you've got a pond, that's great. But having a source of water that they can get to that has slope sides so they can walk to it and get out of it. If they fall into a dish, oftentimes they'll drown. But having a slope side that they can climb back out is a really good thing for them because they need water too. They can get it from the dew, but having a solid source of water helps a lot. Have sun and shade locations. As it gets hot, uh, hot Iowa summers, they need to get out of that sun and get in the shade so that they can cool themselves down um, is good. And then as much as possible, I can't say enough, limit your turf because turf does nothing for pollinators, insects in general. Here's just a real quick, simple garden layout. Using your general practices, you want to plant the tall stuff in the back, Joe Pieweed, Butterfly Bush, The Blazing Star. Plant those in the back or in the middle if it's a round bed. Um, I don't recommend putting host plants in the front. When the caterpillars get on it, they're going to eat it down to sticks, and nobody really wants to look at sticks. Plus, if you put it on the edges, the predators will find those caterpillars easier. So you want to put the host plants in the planting space. And then your shorter plants up towards the front. Good size plantings of each, and then have a good diversity for different insects. Butterfly houses! These are wonderful for wasps and spiders. They're not doing anything for your butterflies. Um, the whole thought behind it is that uh, butterflies would go in them. The only time that a butterfly might is something like we mentioned before, the morning cloak overwinters in the state. They overwinter in things like log piles and loose bark on trees, rock piles, wherever they can get out of the wind but still be in the cold. Um, but these things are painted so pretty, no one leaves them out. Don't worry if you leave them out in the winter, no one will use them anyways. But I always laugh that people put them out in the one time a year that they might possibly slim, slim chance get used, the winter months, they put them in their garden sheds where no one will use them. Um, so if you want to put something out in your garden so that will get used, these mason bee or orchard bee homes are great. You can go online, just Google mason bee, orchard bee, and they'll give you instructions. They can be as simple as a block of wood with holes drilled into them at different sizes, and they'll move into them. And they're a great pollinator, and they don't sting. Bumblebees are another great one. You can actually put bumblebee houses out on your property and possibly get the bumblebees to use them. You have to have them out early in the spring so when the new queens are finding locations for their nests, they might use these. There's a lot of work being done on this and it's hit or miss. Um, if you look for instructions on how to catch a new queen, you can actually train her to a bumblebee box. Uh, it's also possible, though, just to buy bumblebees in. You can buy your own bumblebee box that you can get and put in your yard, and they'll pollinate. Um, again, this is used a lot in greenhouse production of tomatoes. 
Another thing you can put out in your yard is for paper wasps. The paper wasps make those nests. Typically, uh, everyone thinks of them being right over their doors of their eaves or their gutters, and they're a nuisance there because every time you go in and out, you upset them, they fly at you, they may sting you. If you put these box out, they'll use these versus those locations oftentimes, keeping them away from where you don't want them. Um, but they're good to have in the garden again because they're a predator. They eat lots of insects, so they'll keep your pests down. Um, if you want to have butterflies and other insects out in your garden, you have to limit your pesticides usage. And I understand that there are pests like grasshoppers and things that will eat them. So whenever possible, try and use beneficial, encourage beneficials. Um, you know, things like a praying mantis in your yard is great because they eat a lot. I don't recommend buying in the Othecas because most of them disperse and spread out. And you end up with one at the end of all the hundreds you released. Um, but it is possible to buy beneficial insects in. If you're going to do it in an outdoor situation, though, you really need to screen the plant because most of them, when you release them, their initial instinct is to disperse and fly away. And you're going to end up with only a couple individuals working in your garden um, where everyone else will get all the stuff you bought. So if you want to do beneficials in an outdoor situation, you need to screen the plant for a time period, let the beneficials get established on it, and then move the screen away. Now some other things. Um, monarchs are all the rage right now. A good source for monarch information is Monarch Joint Ventures. That's kind of where all the different monarch groups have gone together on one website um, so you can get all your monarch goodness there. Blank Park Zoo. Um, right here in Iowa, they have their pollinator um, gardening program that they're running right now called Plant Grow Fly. Um, Ryman Gardens is helping with this as well as many other partners in the state right now. Um, you can register your garden as a, as a Plant Grow Fly garden and get a cute little sign. What's interesting right now though is uh, you can almost get more gardening signs for your garden support, showing that you support pollinators than maybe the plants you have in it. Xerxes has theirs, uh, Monarch Watch has theirs, there's a new SHARE program through the USDA, I believe, or Department of Agriculture or somebody. Um, so there's lots of pollinator signs. So if you want to show that you have a pollinator garden, any one of these groups here, you can get a sign to show you have a pollinator garden. They give your garden no protection under the law. Uh, Ramen Gardens has some fun information for you. So if you want a list of pollinator-friendly plants, you can do um, host plants for butterflies, nectar plants of different perennials, um, shrubs, trees, we've got a list right on our website at that address right there. We also have a program called the Iowa Butterfly Survey Network where we train citizen scientists to go out in the field and survey butterfly populations in the wild. Um, so if you're interested in helping with something like that, you can visit our website for more information on how to get involved. And then we created an app with some Iowa State students called the Unified Butterfly Recorder, and it's used for surveying butterfly or any really species, um, but we designed it for butterflies, so to survey butterflies out in the wild. So you can take this app, go out with your phone or your tablet in your yard, and actually survey and record what you're finding out there. Um, and it maps and does all other cool features, so another fun thing to check out online. Really get involved. Um, there's lots of citizen science going on right now and lots of different things depending on what species you want. If you want to do butterflies, Journey North is great for monarchs and just tracking them on the way down. The Vanessa Project is for painted ladies and red admirals. Um, butterflies and moths in North America, lots of species of butterflies. You can just import e-butterflies, a new thing out of Canada, very similar to butterflies and moths in North America. Um, something for bees, something for ladybugs, dragonflies, fireflies. There's lots of citizen science going on out there, right? now. So find a program and help out. It's funny, you look at a lot of these maps right now, and I was blank. Not because we don't have them, but because we need more people surveying to get us on the maps. So help out and join one of the citizen science programs. And then finally, I've got a plea for everyone right now. So hopefully you're all watching this before it's too late. Um, there is a House Joint and Senate Resolution that is in front of the Iowa House and Senate to get Iowa an official state butterfly. Iowa has a state rock, a state tree, a state bird, a state flower, but no official state insect. And actually now we're only, because New Hampshire just added one to theirs, we're one of only three states that does not have an official state insect or state butterfly. And if you're like, well, why does Iowa need another official state symbol anyways? Iowa has less official state symbols than any other state we could use a couple more, 
and butterflies would be a great one. So the Regal Fritillary has a bill right now in front of the state house to have to be listed as an official state butterfly. Why the Regal Fritillary? They're a native species. Their range now, kind of, I was in the core of it. They've lost the eastern part. They're, we're kind of like the heart of their range right now, so we need to keep them here. They have a wonderful life history. In the fall, the females lay their eggs in tall grass prairie, down on the ground where their host plant will come up the next year, which is bird's foot violet and prairie violet. So that's died back. It's the nest completely to the ground. The eggs are laid. The eggs hatch in the late fall, early winter time periods. Those caterpillars eat their eggs. That little picture of a caterpillar you will see on the screen over there, they eat their eggs and then nothing else until next spring when the host plant comes up again. So monarchs, they fly off and go down to Mexico and, you know, cups with the little umbrellas drinking, sipping those drinks. These guys tough it out as their smallest, tiniest stage in Iowa, in Iowa winters, um, until the next spring. You know, one meal. They then eat their prairie violet or their bird's foot violet, whichever. They pupate. Um, they turn into adult butterflies. The male and females are flying around. They mate. Uh, the females then survive the hot Iowa summers where the males tend to die off until fall when they can lay their eggs again. So a really tough Iowa butterfly that has a nice strong tie to Iowa would be a great symbol for the state, um, especially with their strong tie to our Iowa native, you know, habitat. Um, so call your local state representative in the House and Senate and tell them they should support House uh, Joint Senate Resolution 2 um, so that we can get an official state butterfly. And with that, I am to the end of my time. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Here's my contact information if you would like to send me an email. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Susan Applegate Hurst. Thanks for joining me this afternoon. And I'm so happy to follow Nathan with pollinators because he said some really key things that I'm going to repeat. And, uh, and it's mostly about these useful bugs he just talked about. I'm going to be talking about useful plants. And that's what herbs are. They, to define herbs generally, we'll just say that they are useful plants. And we're talking about the leafy or herbaceous part of the plants. Um, as opposed to spices, which are generally the dried seeds and roots and barks, things like that. So we're going to be growing the most delicious parts. And um, this is one of the most popular herbs that everybody wants to grow. Um, you all recognize this is lavender. This was in my front yard, and I loved my lavender, and lavender loves the alkaline soil in West Des Moines, and my limestone steps, so that was the perfect place for them in the full sun. The other herb that everybody wants to grow is basil. And I said basil, but you can say basil. The official American um, uh, Herb Society version is uh, basil, but it doesn't matter. As, well, I want you to point, I want to know, know, I want to point out something right away though, is that this is not how the basil is supposed to look in your garden. You should have harvested before it got to that point. We'll talk about more about harvesting basil later. And this is the reason why you're going to grow that basil, right? Because you plan to eat it. Herbs, I think of as the gateway plant for all those foodies out there who don't really garden. They go to the farmer's markets maybe, or they maybe grow a tomato or two in the yard. But herbs are the perfect gateway plant, and there's two reasons for that. One is that most pests don't bother them, so they're very easy to grow. And they don't take a lot of space. They need a lot of sun, but they don't take a lot of space and they're really pretty simple for most beginners. So I'm going to show you a beginner's herb garden later. It's on your handout, and we'll talk about why those are good choices for beginners. But let's get going here on talking about our favorite herbs. Um, edible flowers are herbs, too. As I said, herbs are useful plants, and I'm talking very broadly useful. We're going to talk about culinary herbs, the, the things that we eat that add flavor and color and are just so distinctive in our dishes. But I want you to know right off the bat that you can add a few ornamental uh, edible flowers to your herb garden. And the flowers of culinary herbs that we eat are generally edible. Now, keep in mind that when we talk about edible flowers, what we're really saying is, yes, you can eat them, and they probably won't make you throw up. That doesn't mean they always taste good. Those pretty little violas, they're beautiful on your plate, but they don't have much flavor. Daylilies, not Asiatic, but daylilies, hemerocallus, are edible, but they don't taste like much except maybe kind of green beanie. But keep in mind that we're going to be growing herbs that can be beautiful and useful in our gardens, and we're going to have a few of these flowers to throw in our dishes too. Uh, on the left, those are uh, violas. And I don't recall which one, but they're beautiful. And also violas are much more fragrant than their larger cousins, the pansies. And then on the right is borage. And a lot of times you'll see when you go to a cute little herb shop or you see like, I don't know, trivets and coffee cups and all kinds of things. And you'll see borage on there and hardly anybody eats it. Uh, it's a great plant for pollinators, early season pollinators, as Nathan was talking about. And it's one of the few true blue flowers that you can have in your garden. Super simple to grow. Uh, the leaves and, uh, and the stems are pretty pubescent, not too tasty, but the flowers are beautiful and taste like cucumbers. So we've got edible flowers we're going to add to our list. But you know, the world of herbs is huge. This is very broad. And I'm going to reiterate again, we're going to talk about culinary herbs. Herbs, useful plants, do many, many things. They might have purposes that we think of as medicinal. They may do things that keep the pests away from our pets and from our yards. Um, they, they do all kinds of things, but we're going to focus on the herbs that we use in the kitchen. And I want you to start with the flavors you know and use. When you're a newbie at this, uh, it can be very tempting to go to the nursery and, as I did, buy a whole flat that I didn't really need. I went for four things, came back with 12. You all know that story. So anyway, in this flat of herbs I've got here, uh, I want you to understand that although you might use sage with your turkey stuffing in the fall, there is a particular 
variety of sage, salvia officinalis, that you'll be looking for to grow in your garden. But when you go shopping, there are going to be lots of salvias out there. All kinds of things that are technically edible, but they can be really a little on the stinky side. Uh, they can be really beautiful. Uh, but we're going to look for things like salvia officinalis. If you look if you're shopping for herbs, there are going to be a few things you'll find that have, as their specific name, officinalis. And that means that um, in the you know, ancient monastery gardens, and uh, European monks were among the first to grow and name a lot of the useful plants um, and the culinary ones. Officinalis refers to the ones that were the official storekeeping herbs, the ones that they uh, would grow that they definitely wanted to cultivate and harvest and keep for whatever purpose they were using them for. In this picture, the two tallest plants on the left and the right are both sages. They're both salvias. But they aren't very tasty. They're beautiful, but they're not tasty. When you go shopping, I want you to look for the things that you already use in the kitchen and go to a place that knows what they're talking about. I would hate for someone to walk into a shop where they were looking at all the herbs, but that herb collection in the store might actually include things that are not meant to be used for food. They may be, they may have medicinal purposes, they may have pest repellent purposes like artemisia, no you don't eat it, yes they call it wormwood, and they call it wormwood because you used to take it in order to um, eliminate intestinal parasites. I don't want you to start medicating like that. We're going to talk about the things that you've already cooked with, the basil, oregano, parsley, um, the sage, thyme, even the lavender, if you've cooked with lavender flowers a little bit, uh, things like that. We're going to keep our list fairly small for people who are starting out because we want them to be comfortable and not have bad reactions to, that, to things. Um, so when you, go sh when you go shopping, be prepared to know what you're looking for and to get the right plant in the right place. So first of all, we're going to need a sunny spot. Most of the culinary herbs that you and I cook with, that we grew up with, I would say the majority of them probably came from the Mediterranean, North Africa, that area where they had a lot of sun. Now, the reason we cook with those herbs is because those useful plants were very adaptable and they basically followed cultures all over the world and that's how we ended up with basil here in the U.S. and oregano and fennel and thyme uh, and parsley because we were able to get them to adapt to us and they had um, we adapted to their needs and that's what we've got now. So it's what we're used to cooking with. There are a lot of herbs that maybe are used in, um, oh it could be in Northern European or Asian cooking or South African cooking that we don't know about um, and you may be able to track those down if you have a real interest in them and there are some resources for that. But a lot of the basic culinary herbs need good sun, they need good drainage. Most of them do not like wet areas. They're very drought tolerant. Um, and I've seen some herb books say things like herbs prefer poor dry soil. Well, so does can the thistle and pigweed. Well, that's because our, our herbs are adaptable and also because we want that sharp drainage so they will thrive and we don't want them to get big and floppy because the bigger and taller and juicier they get you could say that there's a little less flavor per leaf because the plant can just get that way. It doesn't have to be thrifty at all if it's being overfed and overwatered. And then you get a big stiff um, wind and some rain and they all flop because they couldn't support themselves. Like a lot of, uh, a lot of the flowers in our perennial gardens will do the same thing. So sun, good drainage. Put the right plant in the right place. Most of them take sun. Some things you'll, you can put a little bit into the shade. Um, Kinds of slows them down a little bit, but um, it'll, it'll like parsley, for example. And also um, keep in mind that we're not growing fruiting plants. We're not growing tomatoes and peppers. They don't need a very fertile soil. They don't want to be totally in wasteland, but you don't want to be fertilizing them because again, they'll get too big and too juicy. They won't have the best flavors. Um, and we're going to start your own seeds. You can buy plants. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And we're going to watch out for some of those garden bullies. And I think you've probably already met one or two um, if you've planted certain herbs. So we'll list those too. A lot of us don't have garden space, but that's great because, again, herbs are great for those newbies that just have containers. You just don't have a spot that's big enough to plant an herb garden. And by the way, 
if you've looked at some of the uh, you know books on growing herbs and you see these beautifully patterned knot gardens, that's not a rule. You don't have to do that. The knot garden thing is is more a result of uh, many many years ago uh, people who had either time or they had conscripts to create those beautiful knot gardens. We don't have that kind of time necessarily or that kind of space. Containers are fine. However, when you go to Kmart and you see the cute little herb starting set with the little pots and the seeds. They're adorable, aren't they? And the picture shows these little herbs growing in these little pots. That's fine for starting seeds, but for those plants to live in those little bitty pots on your windowsill, that's like you living in a Volkswagen for a year. They're not going to thrive. It's a great way to start plants, but it's not how you're going to grow them. Get bigger pots. Most annuals, like let's say you want to grow basil in a pot. I would say um, if you only have like a six inch pot, that's one plant. That's one basil plant. There's not enough root, root, root uh, space in there for that plant to grow and thrive. So for most annuals, go for at least an eight inch pot. And for perennials, I'd say at least a 12 inch pot. Otherwise, you're going to limit what that plant can do. And if you want to harvest it, you're going to have to give it some space to grow. Also, if you've grown many things in containers, you know little pots dry out. And a hot, windy day, like we just had last week, um, you know, 90 degrees and 25 mile an hour winds, that pot is like totally parched by noon. So give them a break. Let them get through the day. Start with a bigger pot. At least six hours of sun per day. Again, we're not growing vegetables, so we don't, we can get away with a little bit more shade. If you've got the option for morning sun, over at hot afternoon sun, that's best for most plants. Some will tolerate that sun better than others, but at least six hours of direct sun, even if it's divided up into morning and evening, direct sun. And containers uh, on the perennials will need to be protected in the winter because their roots just won't have enough protection and they will not make it through the winter unless you're taking that pot into an unheated shed. Um, or garage where it can, it's been allowed to go dormant and it won't get so cold that the roots are destroyed in the, uh, in the winter. So we're going to protect those in the winter when you're growing in containers. And because um, you are watering containers, and this is the same case with watering flowers in containers, or if we get heavy rains, nutrients get washed out of the pot. So you may have to add a little bit of fertilizer to containers in order to keep that plant happy and uh, thriving. So here's the beginner's garden. And this is just something I prepared because I think a lot of people want to know what to start with. But I also chose these plants because they get you started early in the spring. And this selection gives you a good starter garden. It's a great way to get a range of experience by growing plants more than one way and by growing a variety of plants that have different needs. So you'll learn a lot more. Um, and you can cut down on this, but uh, this is a good way to get started. So at the top of the list, the ones that are easy to grow from seed and they're fast growing early in the season. And I wish you could taste these with me or I wish I could pass around cuttings right now because that would get you more inspired. Early in the spring, you're going to plant the cool season annuals. One of those is chervil, and I'll bet almost none of you have grown chervil or have cooked with it. Remember I start with, so I start with the seasonings or the herbs that you know and use. If you've used um, a, a, a blend of herbs called Herbs de Provence, sometimes there's chervil in that. But um, chervil is one of those things that the, it loves cool weather. It's one of the very first things that will germinate in the spring, and actually it's a half-hardy annual. If it germinated in the fall in your garden and it got some snow cover, it will actually be green under the snow and it will green up again in the spring and you'll be harvesting a little bit of chervil to use in eggs and vegetables and salads right off the bat. Chervil tastes like a combination of um, uh, like a mild parsley with a little fennel. It's not a super strong herb. A lot of the really strongest tasting herbs need summer heat. Chervil doesn't like summer heat. It's very short lived, just like its cousin, the next herb, cilantro. Now, if you've grown cilantro, or if you've used cilantro in cooking, you may know that the dried version and the little container at the store taste like grass clippings. So that's why you need to grow up fresh. And chervil is the same way. That's probably the biggest reason you ever cooked with chervil. 
because you didn't have it fresh and if you bought the dried version it was a huge disappointment. So Chervil and cilantro both like cool weather and I've got coriander slash cilantro there. Coriander and cilantro are actually the same plant. Um, coriander, it, we use coriander in cooking uh, as the dried seed, little round seeds um, that are a spice and you usually find it ground or whole. We sometimes put it in pickles. It's sometimes used in um, Scandinavian cooking and um, also a lot in East Indian cooking. Um, but cilantro is the herbaceous or leafy part of that plant. And yes, you can let it go to seed and you can harvest your own coriander. You can do that too. Or they'll just plant the coriander seeds and then you'll have more cilantro. Um, both shrivel and cilantro or coriander can be allowed to reseed in the garden and they will not become uh, huge pests. So it's okay to go ahead and let a few of those plants do that. They are both short-lived. They both like cool season. Get them in the ground early. And with cilantro, go ahead and plant some every couple of weeks through like the middle of July. And it will germinate as, it, as the weather tolerate, as lets it tolerate. Um, it will keep coming up. Um, cilantro is short-lived, so if you think yours died or suddenly, no, it's because that's it. It just has a short life. There is a variety of cilantro called slow bolt. You get maybe another week out of that. So um, it's just something to keep planting more often. Um, chives, you can also grow from seed, but surely somebody will share some with you because they're very easy to grow. They're super hardy. You dig a chunk out, you put it in your garden, and if you manage it like I'll tell you about later, it's not going to go crazy and get away and create terrible problems for you. Dill, you can also plant early in the season. It loves cool weather. Parsley, another one of those host plants. Nathan brought that up earlier on for the black swallowtail. And you can grow a lot of parsley, either flat leaf or curly leaf. Either one, to me, the flat leaf has a more, much more robust flavor. Uh, but grow plenty of it. Um, and out of all the these herbs here on this list, parsley is really the one that you might have to keep an eye on rabbits with. Because uh, especially on young parsley, they will nibble it off. Everything else they pretty much leave alone. But parsley can fall victim to rabbits, especially those babies in the spring because baby rabbits don't seem to care what they eat. Um, and then also in the spring, uh, here's an edible flower for you. This is a, a pot. It's considered a pot herb. And it's called also pot marigold, and that's calendula. Calendula is also known as pot marigold because you can eat it. The bright yellow or orange flowers were used in the past to color butter. But you can pull the flowers off and then pull the petals out, sprinkle them in salad, mix them into herb butters and cheeses, things like that. They don't have a lot of flavor. Um, and you know, a lot of things that we think of as pot herbs or um, early salad greens, like nobody really eats um, uh, calendula as a as a pot as a pot herb anymore, or as a um, a salad green, that kind of thing. Although you could, or um, uh, purslane. Purslane is actually a really healthy thing um, if it's not been treated with pesticides. But we don't really grow that on purpose anymore. But there are a lot of things that um, you know in the past before the grocery store existed. There were a lot of green things. I mean, we ate a lot of dandelion greens, our, our ancestors did, because that was one of the first green things in the spring. So, um, so pot marigold is called that because it was an early spring green. Um, and the flowers are edible. And mix those in with all your herbs, and, and they're cinched to grow. Children love to plant calendula seeds because the seed looks like a cat claw. So they're big and kind of cool to look at. Um, so early in the spring when the weather's cool, I'm talking about like uh, you know late April, early March, you can go ahead and get that sowed as soon as the ground is workable and then just leave it go and it will all pop up on its own. Late spring planting. Now everybody wants to get their basil in right away and I totally understand that, but it's a waste of time. Don't do that. You can start the seeds indoors if you want, but don't put basil seeds and plants in the ground in Iowa unless we've got a really strange spring and you want to gamble starting early, wait until the end of May. Basil doesn't like nights in the 50s or below. And you know, a lot of times our early May weather is absolutely beautiful and Mother's Day is often quite nice, 
And of course it is, because that's when we go to the nursery, right? That's when all the, all the um, greenhouses and nurseries really count on a lot of sales is that Mother's Day weekend. And we often have nice enough weather. We want to buy everything there is. So we buy a few basil plants in pots, and we take them home. And then the weather in May in Iowa often is unpleasant during the last two weeks of May. Um, colder, wetter, how many nice Memorial Days can you recall in the last 10 years? And maybe that'll change, but my advice now still is to don't put basil seeds or transplants in the garden until the end of May because they, they really need warm weather. They will sulk and be, um, uh, they can get sick. They just won't take off until hot weather anyway, so just hold your horses. And also you can plant nasturtiums. Another edible flower tastes, the leaves and the flowers are edible. The leaves taste a little like radishes. Uh, flowers are much less strong but very pretty um, on salads. So if you take potato salad to somebody's house for a picnic and you've got a couple nasturtiums on the top, they just think you're a genius because I never thought of that before. But um, they're a beautiful complement to salads. So late spring, I'm talking um, in the ground, late spring, end of May, basil and nasturtiums. By then the danger of frost is gone and warm weather will get those plants to pop right up. So that's from seed. That group is the seed plants, the seed herbs that you can start. Um, and yes, you can do them indoors and transplant, but most of that first list, the early spring planting, most of those don't transplant well. Chervil, cilantro, dill and parsley, all in the same family. Um, uh, great pollinator plants because um, as uh, Nathan mentioned, especially for butterflies, they like clusters of flower heads so they can sit once and eat, 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 eat. Much less energy involved than going from this flower to this flower to this flower. Um, so those things all tend to have more of a tap root and they don't transplant as well unless they're very young. So they're best direct seeded. So the next bunch of plants that you can experiment with as a beginner are the slower growing plants that you're going to you're going to buy a potted plant or start them from seed indoors early so that you can plant them in a pot. And for beginners, you you're not going to buy a whole packet just to get one or two sages. I mean, this is easy to do. If you want to do that, go ahead. But I would recommend that you go pick out a good sage, garden sage that you're going to be eating over the summer and into the fall. Lavender, oregano and thyme. Again, you can start those from seed. However, there's different reasons for buying the plants. One is you're going to be able to get the cultivar that you want and then a number that you want. You're probably not going to grow an entire row of sage because you're probably not going to need that much. Lavender you can grow from seed, but the kinds that are best for our climate that are going to be the most attractive in the garden are going to come uh, are going to be um, either uh, head coat. Munstead, Grosso, maybe Provence. There are more varieties available that are hardy, but they're going to be the um, Angustifolias because the, ink, the, uh, the French lavenders, the spike lavenders with the dentated leaves, you know, the little zigzaggy leaves, those aren't hardy here. Uh, you want the lavender that has a smooth edge to the leaf. Uh, they're going to be more likely to be hardy for us. And if you, you can't really grow those from seed without being extraordinarily patient. Um, and, you know, especially beginners want results right away that pay off because that keeps them going. Um, and oregano, uh, one plant is all you really need. It's, you're going to be working to keep that one plant under control as it is. So just buy yourself a pot of oregano. And there's Greek or Italian. The leaf form and the, and the habit of the plant is slightly different. Um, Greek oregano sometimes thought of as hotter. Um, it's your choice. And then thyme, uh, English or French thyme, uh, for using uh, for culinary purposes. Uh, English thyme generally has a slightly softer form and a little rounder leaf. French has a more pointier leaf and a little more upright. Uh, either one is fine, but you know when when you go shopping, you're going to find many kinds of thyme and many kinds of lavender and many kinds of sage and it's you're going to have to go with a little bit of education first or go someplace as I said earlier that where there's some where people know what they're talking about and they can help you out the sages in particular I know you've seen the variegated purple and white or the variegated green and white sage 
has much the same flavor as Salvia officinalis, the plain green garden sage, but as in all plant breeding, you can't change just one thing in the plant. If you change to create variegation or difference in color, it's likely that something else has changed. And the flavor of those pretty sages, in my opinion, is not as good, as robust, as flavorful as the Salvia officinalis. Um, and so this way you can get exactly the plants you want. And then there are two plants that I think you should only get from cuttings or divisions. Um, buy it potted, uh, have someone grow it for you, have someone share it with you. One of those is tarragon. And re true French tarragon, is an, it's an artemisia, but unlike the artemisias that we find that are annoying and are bullies, tarragon almost never flowers and almost never sets viable seed and it doesn't run nearly as fast as other artemisias do. Um, I've been surprised at how people haven't cooked with fresh tarragon. It's really, really delicious, especially with chicken and pork, and um, it tastes a little like, oh, I know, that's why you don't cook with it. You don't like licorice. Well, that's too bad, because <laughs> that's what tarragon tastes like. It's a little bit, it's a little like licorice, um, and some people don't like that flavor. But it's really delicious with chicken and pork. And then rosemary, I would buy a plant of that or a, a get a cutting started from someone else. Because what you want in Iowa is a nice upright rosemary. If you've been to, say, California and seen outside the mall someplace, they have these beautiful stony banks with rosemary draping down the side. It's lovely and, it's, and it is edible. But they have a drier climate than we do. And remember I, I told you that a lot of plants need full sun and good drainage. Rosemary is one of those. However, it needs frequent small amounts of moisture, and the, but it doesn't like humidity, really. So our hot summers uh, with the high humidity and then sometimes pounding rain, if you've got a prostrate rosemary growing in your garden, it's going to be covered with dirt. It's going to get sick because it'll be too wet most of the time. Get an upright rosemary, um, and that, and you can choose that at the store. And um, however, I would recommend that you buy rosemary, you know, a little four-inch pot that's meant to be on the culinary herbs for your culinary garden. I would recommend that you not buy the topiaries that have been shaped and grown in the greenhouse for several months. Um, and at Christmas time, you see a lot of those. They're beautiful to have, and go ahead and pet them and smell them. But I would be careful about using those particular plants because if they've been greenhouse grown for that many months, they've also probably had a fungicide used on them. And, um, you know, a lot of greenhouse production isn't meant to be eaten right away. So um, buy the rosemary in a smaller pot from a uh, greenhouse or a grower who's growing it for culinary use and has not been treating it. Um, as a topiary and growing it under controlled conditions, probably with chemicals, uh, for some months. So um, you may find, uh, yes, you can, you can plant rosemary from seed. You can. But you know what? Uh, there's not enough rosemary in the whole wide world, and life is too short. So you want your rosemary to be bigger than four inches tall by August. And that's why I would buy a pot in May and get it planted at the end of May, and you get to harvest over the summer. And the tarragon you can find seed for, but you don't find it for the right kind of tarragon. There's actually a seed for something called Russian tarragon, and right now the species escapes me, but it has a similar, um, a similar fragrance and flavor, but nothing nearly as good as true French tarragon. So um, those are the plants you're going to be doing from, um, that you're definitely going to be buy uh, from in a pot or from cutting. And watch out for these invasive guys. Mint. I want you to beware of the square. And this is your hint. Your hint of mint is beware of the square. Can you remember that? Your hint of mint is to beware of the square. Plants in the mint family have a square stem. The mint family is a big one. And if you've grown peppermint, spearmint, any, any of the multitude of, of genetic variations of, of, uh, of uh, mentha, you know that it's invasive. It will get away, it will run across the ground and under the driveway, across the street, just like takes off. And, um, uh, you know, heaven help you if you take a rototiller to it. Don't ever do that. 
So anyway, anything with a square stem, and that includes um, sages and uh, basil, uh, coleus even, in that family, they tend to spread quickly by seed or by root or by both. Um, lemon balm it can be very invasive. Again, it's in the mint family. So anything with a square stem, you're warned now, all right? Um, the Artemisias also, other than French tarragon, um, Art the Artemisia family can be very invasive, so be careful of that. And Sweet Annie, which is lovely in dried arrangements, um, will reseed and reseed and reseed and for generations, no matter how hard you try to eradicate it. So it can be very hard to control. This plant in the picture, horseradish. If you want to grow horseradish, be sure that you're planting it where it's going to live beyond the time of your life. It has roots that I swear go all the way to China. You have to be careful about harvesting it. So if you plant horseradish, be very sure that it's right where you want it. And do harvest it and use it. And dill. I get more complaints from people in herb gardening about the dill that just won't go away. Well, they keep letting it go to seed. We're going to see how to take care of that. Mint deserves its own special pot. That way it won't be taking off in the garden. But it can smother itself in a pot, actually, every two or three years. Take out about a quarter of that root ball, repot that, and destroy the rest. Not in the compost pile. It will live there. And don't give it away to gullible people. It will get away there, too. Throughout the season, you're going to mulch your herbs lightly. And I say that because you're harvesting a leaf crop, and mulching will help to reduce how much washing you're doing of those leaves. It'll keep the rain from bouncing the soil back up on the leaves. Keep them wetted, weeded, thin them, stake some of the tall things like if you grow something exotic like angelica because the wind might knock it over. Um, pinch prune deadhead throughout the season but don't fertilize. Um, you really shouldn't need to. You're going to water the perennials well the first season like you would any perennial so they get well established. And you're going to protect the tender plants in the wintertime, like rosemary. I, I think there needs to be a support group for those of us who want to take our rosemary indoors for the winter. Perennial cleanup begins in early spring. And I was so happy to hear Nathan say, clean up the garden in the spring. Um, two reasons. One, I'm tired in October. I don't clean my garden up in the fall that much, unless there's like disease stuff, and then I get rid of it. But in early spring, Cut back all the, like this is oregano, cut back the dead uh, foliage, rake off the leaves, make room for the new growth. Um, and here's that support group idea for the rosemary. Um, that's going to have to go indoors for the winter. So what I often do is I'll put that four inch pot I bought into a gallon pot and sink that to the edge of the pot and then lift it in early September, get it adjusted to going indoors. What it would really like to do is go dormant in Texas. Well, we can't do that. What it would really like is to go dormant in a bright, unheated room in your house. But nobody keeps unheated rooms in their houses anymore. We used to. The second floor was always unheated. Um, but you can try to bring it indoors someplace where it's going to get a lot of direct light, good ventilation, and it's not going to get too dried out and give it a try. Often it will do really well until February and then it goes uh, toes up, but um, it's worth a try. All right, I want you to think about now the herbs that you maybe have already grown or the herbs you cook with. I want you to share with the group one idea where it's you already use dried herbs that you're going to try fresh herbs in. And how can you connect that idea to a master gardener project? And we'll take a break.
All right, I hope you had some really good ideas for recipes. And those of you who now know the difference between what a dried herb tastes like compared to its fresh version, you can proselytize about that all you want because that is the key here. I think people don't realize how much difference there is between fresh and dried flavor. Remember I mentioned at the beginning about cilantro and chervil. People didn't use it that much until they tasted fresh cilantro and, and like Mexican dishes because when you dry it, it tastes like nothing. That's because it's one of those herbs that when you dry it, those top notes just evaporate. So if you, you have to have it fresh. Otherwise, you won't even know what it tastes like. And everything is the same way. Everything loses this most volatile flavors when you dry it. So having the fresh virgin, um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that at the very end here with the recipe, um, the fresh version beats dried almost always. Almost always. Okay. I'm waiting for a slide. There we go. Now for the best part for harvesting. Generally you're going to harvest right before the plant flowers. Uh, and that would be, you know, before it's really formed flower buds that are visible. Because a plant's job, especially an annual plant's whole job in one season, it has to grow, flower, make babies, and die. And it's going to be in a hurry to do that in the season. Once it begins to flower, it's going to start to change flavor. It's going to become less flavorful, more bitter, for example, because it's trying to make sure that nobody eats it and it can make babies. Um, and remember, the, all these flavors and herbs are basically a defense mechanism in the first place. That's why they have fewer pests, both insect and um, uh, two- and four-legged, because of the flavors in them. So we're going to harvest before they flower. For perennial plants, you can do that on an ongoing basis, um, starting in the season. Not too early. Let it get warm and let it have some growth on it so the flavor develops. Short-lived annuals, like cilantro, for example, all at once. It's kind of hard to do just a few leaves on the outside because it's going to bolt before you know it. That's why you buy cilantro in bunches and parsley in bunches at the grocery store because they get harvested all at once basically. And other plants are if in doubt up to a half of the plant at a time and it will survive that. So here's our oregano that um, we cleaned up in the spring a little bit. Don't harvest it right away. Let it grow a little bit more and then it's just beginning to form some flower buds. Get it before it gets to those flower buds and cut back uh, a third to a half of the plant and it will, won't look very good. It'll come back out of that. If you decide to let it go flower, and you can certainly do that for the pollinators, for example, deadhead it because otherwise you're going to have seeds everywhere. So I often would let part of the plant uh, go ahead and bloom or let's say I just got busy and didn't harvest it. Go ahead and let it bloom but then when the flowers fade, after the pollinators are done with them, then deadhead that so they won't be spreading seeds everywhere. Cutting back can keep things under control when they're invasive, uh, like mint or like chives. So here's what I do with chives. Chives bloom in the spring. Uh, in the late spring, those beautiful purple flower heads. I'll harvest the flower heads to make chive vinegar. And if you Google chive vinegar, you're going to find how to do that. It's super simple and it's beautiful pink oniony vinegar for salad dressings. So then after they, the flowers fade and the pollinators are through with this, then you get a conscript to cut those chives down maybe two inches tall. What you're doing then is you're keeping the plant from having the energy to spread out forcing it to regrow up in the same space so it'll be tidier later in the season and it may actually rebloom. Um, and with mint, you're going to keep cutting it also to help prevent it from just taking over and running away and jumping over the edge of the pot. Another reason to harvest this dill that people complain about all the time. You know, it's again, it's a wonderful pollinator plant, but Every seed, I swear, must be viable. So if you allow all that dill to go to seed, you're going to have a problem. And this is a patch of dill that was all volunteers. And look how spindly and close together those plants are. Uh, dill leaves are my favorite part of the plant. I don't use the seed heads, and I don't use the seed that much, but I love the leaves, like in pasta salads and couscous salads and on fish and, and um, chicken, or just clipped into green salads. So you're going to be watching this. You're, you can go ahead and let it bloom if you want. Let the pollinators have at it. The seeds are green. You're still safe here. And then they turn brown. And as they turn brown, you know, you're being warned. They're changing color. You're being warned. What I do is I deadhead all the patch, but pick maybe one 
beautiful, robust plant and leave that seed head. And then grab that at the top of the stalk. This is the ones they've turned brown, like in the, in the photo. Grab that seed head and bend the stalk and aim it down right at the ground and that is where the seed will go so that it won't end up blowing dill here and there and all over the place. You'll be able to keep your dill patch under control. If you got too much dill in the spring, thin it out because they won't be as nice a plant if they're all crowded together and skinny and spindly. Like I said, you've been warned here. Um, this is cilantro that has begun to bolt. And the pinching back to delay flowering is sort of a myth. People say, well, you know, if the basil starts to bloom or the cilantro is blooming, just pinch that flower stalk out. As I said before, the flavor is going to change. And it's, it's kind of moot at this point. Just harvest the poor guy and instead of torturing it. Because um, it's not going to grow back that many leaves, especially cilantro. So um, go ahead and, and harvest it and then do... Se uh, sequential plantings through the season so you'll have that cilantro later on or that basil and that basil is sneaky see this uh, shot you've got that little tiny flower bud just forming that's how it looks you should harvest it at that minute don't wait any longer hopefully you harvest it before that up to a third of the plant at a time it'll regrow new shoots if you're curious about me being truthful on this then go ahead and let it bloom and then taste a leaf at the top of the plant compared to a leaf at the bottom of the plant and you can taste the difference. They call it, sometimes they call it sweet basil. That refers not to sugary sweetness but to a lack of bitterness. And you can tell that these newer leaves are more bitter. The best flavor is from younger basil. Again, sow it more than once a season. Every couple of weeks and you'll have it. So to preserve that great flavor, you're going to freeze it. You're going to chop it in the food processor. That's what it works best. So what I do is like the night before, afternoon before, the morning of a harvest, I go out with my spray attachment, my hose, and I hose everybody off under the leaves, all the way over. I've mulched, so I don't have soil bouncing back up again. Let that dry off um, like by mid-morning. Go out and harvest. And I'm, that way I won't have to draw, do much washing in the sink because it's really hard to work with wet herbs. So I'm going to put two packed cups of clean dry herbs in the food press. You're going to pack your measuring cup tight. Two packed cups of clean herb. Put that in the food processor. Couple of pulses. Add a quarter cup of oil, like a good extra virgin olive oil. Pulse it a few more times. You want a paste. You don't want a sauce. And then I put it into either a small container like this with not much headspace, or better yet, this batch fits perfectly in a one quart freezer bag. Fill that, press the air out, and then flatten the bag so it's kind of flat, fits in the freezer really well. Um, and then when you want to use it later in the winter, get it out as you are cooking. Maybe let it thaw just a little bit on the edges and you can break or cut off a chunk and use it like you would fresh. The flavor is totally beets dried. You'll never go back. But you don't hoard it. If you put it in the freezer, plan to use it. Okay. When you're using it, you're going to use two to three times as much in your measuring tools, fresh herbs, as you would dry it. If you dry it, it's going to shrink, right? So fresh herbs take more volume. If you're going to dry the herbs, don't use the microwave and don't dry them in the sun. You, don't, you aren't trying to toast them. You want the moisture to leave without forcing out flavor. Um, if you ever drop herbs into a pot of soup and then you could smell it, that was flavor leaving and that same thing happens when you dry um, herbs uh, for preservation. Microwaves often have hot spots and they can start to cook before you know it. Don't use the microwave. Drying in the sun will oxidize flavor and color. Don't do that. Air drying at low humidity, air conditioned indoors maybe with some air movement works great and a dehydrator works well too. And the best advice is to use those fresh herbs every day. Make it part of your cooking because you're always going to enjoy that fresh flavor a lot more. And um, you're going to be reminded in the spring to start over again. So don't do like I do and save your herbs for special dishes. And then in May, oh, you still have a bunch of it in the freezer. Go ahead and use it throughout the winter. Because, you know, if you make an herb butter or if you add fresh frozen sage or... Um, thyme, parsley, things like that to the turkey at Thanksgiving or Christmas, believe me, people will know the difference. They can tell right away. So, if you have any questions, 
I hope you'll give me an email um, at susanapplegathurst at gmail.com. Um, I'm happy to help you out, and I can point you to some other resources if you'd like. Um, if you happen to be attending the International Master Gardener Conference, I'll do a longer version of this in Council Bluffs in September. I'm giving a talk on growing and using herbs. Longer version of this talk, and there will be things to smell and taste. Mm. So you can get a better understanding of this. So thanks for spending your afternoon with me, or your evening, whatever it is. And um, please go use some fresh herbs. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Susan. And just a reminder to everyone to please fill out the evaluation form and jump over to the hours reporting system to log your hours. And I hope that you enjoy watching some pollinators around your garden and also eating some delicious herbs. Yes. I know that I'm hungry. Or watch pollinators eating herbs. There we go. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, everybody.